everybody, and welcome to Conversations at the New York School of the Arts. Our guest today was born in Beijing, China, and he moved to, uh, to Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he lived for seven years, and then moved to the United States to study composition at the University of Pittsburgh, New England Conservatory, and Harvard University. He is currently a professor at Boston College, and he's a, a wonderful composer, and we're very, very uh, happy and glad to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Lee. So uh, a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much. Sure, happy to be here. And also we have uh, Larry Tamburi, Executive Director of the uh, of New World School of the Arts. Hi, everyone. So, Dr. Lee, um, you have a very diverse background. You know, born in China, lived seven in, for seven years in Brazil, and all the experience in the United States with jazz and classical music. Um, how has uh, all of this diversity affected your music? Well, you know, John Harbison once said, you know, John Harbison, everybody know who John Harbison mm -hmm. is. Um, he once said that the music you listen to that you are engrossed with during your teens will forever make an imprint on your output. Now, I was in Brazil during my teens, between the ages of 15 and 20. And I have to say that music is still in what I do today. So it's inescapable. Uh, in Brazil, I played with the very famous uh, singer songwriter named Chico Buarque de Holanda. And uh, at that time he was not that famous, but after I left, he became so famous that he actually became very politically involved that he was actually kicked out of the country by the junta. So he was in, in Italy for many years and eventually came back. So I was very much involved with the beginning of the whole bossa nova movement, so to speak. So even today, I think I hear a lot of influence from Antonio Carlos Jobim in my music. But of course, Antonio Carlos Jobim was influenced by Frederick Chopin. So everybody's influences everybody, you know? Like the old saying, I think T.S. Eliot said it, uh, amateurs borrow, professionals steal. <laughs> so, so that's what I do. Yeah. Well, Tom, I remember when we commissioned you at the New Jersey Symphony and your flute to karaoke was certainly Brazilian you know, uh, influences in it. I remember. Yeah, uh, definitely Brazilian. Yeah. My yeah. influence now, Brazilian music is more subtle. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't hear the, you know, the obvious Latin groove, but but the harmonic progressions are very uh, Jobim. Mm -hmm. And Jobim always have these long melodic lines. And I think that's very influential. Yeah. One of the great songwriters of all time. Yeah, yeah it's true. It's very true. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a composition of yours that you shared uh, with me before the interview called Almost a Tango. Right. So, it's, yeah. Morango, Almost a Tango. I, I wrote that from a Kronos Quartet. Um, mm -hmm. At that time, I was listening to a lot of um, Piazzolla, you know, Piazzolla and and so there was a lot of uh, piazzolla grooves in that piece, you know. Once again, as I say, I steal from the best. <laughs> so what, who, who are you stealing from today? Uh, Bach. I steal from Bach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most recently, uh, I'm, uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a very long, like a 30-minute song cycle called the Kinder Toten Leader, which is inspired by Mahler. So... This guy who wrote the poems for the, you know, the song of the dead children, mm -hmm. his two children died of scarlet fever, you know, in the 18th century. And he wrote 600 poems about his experience. Wow. So, so I did not use the same poems that Mahler did, but I found 10 that I was, that I used. And uh, so I just, you know, everybody, <laughs> Debussy, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Now, when you were writing this, uh, you know, for example, uh, Almost Tango, you, yeah. you wrote this piece in, in the 80s. Yeah. There was a, a very big push 
that uh, for music to be completely against you know um, tonal tonality. Oh, okay. Uh, what what was it? What was it like to to write music around that time? Do you have any pushback? You know, in the academia. Oh. Well, okay. At that time, I was I just finished graduate school. I got my doctorate from Harvard in 1981, and this piece was written in 1983. Uh, there are several several factors. One was during all that time I was playing jazz at a club in Cambridge called the 1369 Jazz Club. Every Sunday I was playing there with a jazz band. And Marengo is actually a song, a, you know, a 32 bar song that I wrote for the band that we can improvise on. And I have to confess that the entire solo in the first violin is actually a note for note transcription of an improvisation I did one night that I happened to have recorded it. I listened to that recording and said, wow, that's a great solo, let me transcribe it. And so, and the Kronos wanted something jazzier. So that's, that's, a, that's what happened. Okay, now back to the reaction, you know, of um, the academics. Uh, Gunther Schuller was my teacher at the New Conservatory. And I studied with him and, you know, Gunther is a big 12 tone composer. And, uh, in the beginning, when I was a student, very influenced by my teacher, I was writing in a very atonal style, like everybody, you know, a lot of, uh, lot of dissonances and everything. So Gunther was publishing some of my early works. He was happy with that. But with my later works after Marengo, not Marengo, but other, other pieces that were more mainstream, more tonal, he, he said, I'm not going to publish any more music of yours. I said, why not? He said, You've gone off the track. <laughs> That's so typical, right? Gunther knows what my track is. <laughs> this is your track, and you've gotten off it. So that was my. That's the reaction of the academia against what I was doing. Wow. You know, the other the other thing that you mentioned before when we were exchanging emails, you said that uh, in the last ten years your music has changed. Yeah, what well, matured. Uh, has matured. Has matured. Yes, that's yeah, on no. your own words. Yeah, so, yeah. what what is different? What's what's different from um, before ten years and? Okay. And more All right. Than... You, know, you you probably have heard some people say, and this is not just to music, but to everything. Whether you're a novelist, whether you're a um, a painter, you're a playwright, poet, they said that. You, it takes 10 years for you to reach to the point where you find your voice. So that's the same case with Mozart. The difference is that Mozart started composing when he was five. So by the time he was 15, he was writing mature works. So everybody got to pay their dues, 10 years of dues. And in my case, Marengo was basically 10 years from my first piece, Opus One, to Marengo is about 10 years. So. The last 10 years, what happened was I turned 65 in 2010, you know? And I noticed that after 2010, my batting average started at about, um, well, before, before I was 65, my batting average was about 50-50 or even less. <laughs> Good pieces versus, you know. But after that, my average went up to 600 and now it's at a thousand. So now everything I write, I love to the point where a lot of my music is not performed in public anymore. I take my music directly into the recording studio without a public performance. So I'm so confident that this is great that I go straight into the studio and record. And one of the reasons why I do recording versus pushing for live performances is that my music is cursed by Murphy's law. If anything go wrong, it'll go wrong. <laughs> so it's not worth spending money hiring musicians play, playing concert because I come away very depressed. But in the studio, I can say, stop, tempo, take out the metronome, and then we do in so short sections. Everything is digitally edited. And if somebody's out of tune, we can have it tuned. <laughs> so you're like Glenn Gould. Yeah, exactly. So in yeah. the last 10 years, I've been recording my music. So that's another reason why I feel mm -hmm. very 
good about what I do because mm. I think the performances are better and I'm more mature. And uh, anyway, so that's, that's the basic answer. Before that, I would say my output was about 50% good. Uh, the, the piece that the piece that Larry commissioned for New York, that that's one of the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. <laughs> do, do you agree, Larry? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> well, tell me this, Tom. Yeah. Do you, do you prefer going to live performances or listening to CDs? I love live performances, but not of my music. Yeah. Well, it's nerve-wracking anyway, right? Say it again. It's nerve-wracking. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. All I hear is the mistakes. Yeah, right. Of course. I cannot yeah. enjoy. You know. Yeah, yeah. One of the big problems with, you know, people. I'm not saying that people play out of tune. One of my big problems with live performances is that during rehearsal, I say, okay, now that tempo is a little bit slow. Could you, you know, look at the metal? Mm -hmm. But once they're on stage, they lose sense of the right time. Yeah. And yeah. when the tempo is wrong, the the music suffers. Yeah. If it's yeah. too fast, if it's too slow, but in a recording studio, I said metronome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember this was a long time ago. I don't even want to say how long ago, but I remember you were influenced when you were writing tunes by Wayne Shorter. Does that does does that still there? No, no, that's not not no. anymore. You know, I'm yeah. I I still love jazz, but yeah. I'm. I'm much more, for me, good jazz is tunes with two, five, one progressions, mm -hmm. you know? Wayne mm -hmm. Shorter was trying, you know, was yeah. trying too much, trying to break the mold. Yeah. My, yeah. my idea of a great jazz pianist is uh, Bill Evans, Art mm -hmm. Tatum, you know? Mm -hmm. And even Keith Jarrett, you know, when he yeah. plays standards, I love the way he plays. His solo uh, album's amazing, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And even when he plays free, his mm -hmm. free is so much a thousand times better than anybody who plays free. Mm -hmm. Because Keith just has a better grounding of harmony. The other day I was listening to his Paris concert. Mm -hmm. The entire yeah. movement is like Johann Sebastian Bach improvising. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he could improvise in counterpoint. Yeah. On the That's spot. True. Yeah. That is freaking amazing. Yeah. Nobody can do that. Yeah. Today, there's all these, you know, new guys, Brett Meldow and mm -hmm. uh, Fred Hirsch. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> they, they don't come up to that level. Well, you know who I like who does that is Earl Garner. His intro. Oh, yeah, yeah. Earl Garner. He was amazing with that. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, the dead ones are the best ones. <laughs> 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 and I feel that way about living composers. The dead yeah. ones are the good ones. <laughs> well, I don't want to put you in that category. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean others, not me. <laughs> so, you know, there's another work that you share with, with us uh, before the interview. I, I, I don't know if I, if I pronounce this correctly. A view non avenue. Is oh, that... yeah. A view. A view non avenue. It's That's in it. French. Yeah. A view non avenue. The reason so... why I brought that up is because there's a very strange video that goes with the first movement. So I thought it would be fun to show the score of the first movement and then show the video because I, I know I shot the video, but I now don't remember what happened because as the car is going through the woods, suddenly there was like this black things coming out. They look like bats, but I don't remember how, what, when I shot that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe I shot it and some some ghost put in some. <laughs> you know, I was wondering what those uh, right, black, black things thing. were. Yeah. 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 I, I first, thought you edited first, it. <laughs> no, I didn't do anything. I, at first, I thought there were leaves, right? Leaves. But then it flies away in the front, you know? Huh. They look like, I don't know what it is. So I'm fascinated by that video because I don't remember taking it, but it was on my computer. <laughs> You know, and it was in terms of the, you know, the each computer has a number. The number sort of follows the other videos I've shot. So it's not as if I stole it from the internet or anything. It, it was on my computer in my in my iPhoto. It was there. So that's bizarre. So, 
<laughs> so now for the first time in you know first time for composers we have ac access to cameras and and is yeah, yeah. you know is for the first time we can actually uh you know not only create the music but also create videography and you're doing that uh in in many of your yeah. um, most recent works you know including yeah. um including the the a view non a view new yeah so uh the question is um can you tell us more about the relationship between these these two the videography and and music well okay again as i said my life's basically changed in 2010 when i turned 65. i thought my music is getting better and 2010 was also the time i started shooting videos now I was a very serious photographer when I was at University of Pittsburgh. I, I worked for the student newspaper, I worked for the yearbook. And the reason I did that is because I get to use their dark room. So since the 70s, I've been very serious about photography as a hobby, I'm not doing this professionally. So, but in 19, in 2015, my wife and I went to Paris, you know, for vacation. And we had an apartment near the uh, Louvre. And the window outside the apartment showed somebody else's window. And there was this curtain that was waving outside the window. The window was open, the, with the curtain was outside the window. And I said, well, that's an interesting scene. So I took out my camera and shot a seven minute video of just that, nothing happening. And then when I got home and I looked at my, uh, my, the length of my Marengo, almost a tango, is the same length. So I said, okay, I'm going to put that on there. <laughs> so that was my video number one. So, so, so for me, the video and the music, the whole idea is very serendipitous. First of all, I shoot the video without really thinking about what music goes with it. I, I, don't, I don't shoot a video for the music. For the, music. the video comes along for its, for its visual quality, all right? And then I will look at the length of the video, right? Let's say of three minutes and 40 seconds. Then I go to my iTunes library and I look for a movement that's three minutes and whatever. I need to find a music that's shorter than the video because by the time I add the title and the end credits, it eats up the video because I like to have it fade in. So that's basically it. the video dictates what music, and then I find the right length, and then I put it together. I said, "Ah, eh, that doesn't work." Then I go find another one that's three minutes in it until I find a nice combination. Sometimes the music goes with the video. Sometimes it doesn't. So, so I was saying in my email, it's very John Cageian. It's very serendipitous, very mm -hmm. whimsical. It's it's a hobby. I I don't do it for anything serious, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm surprised. Now I put 300. 300. I'm surprised to hear that because in in you in your videos, I thought that the 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 videography and the music really. Oh well, thank they, you. They were really linked, but yeah, uh, that's you. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if it does, if it's really, well, I you know, I guess the artistic sensibility says that's acceptable. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you make a judgment and all artists have to make judgments. So I guess I make a judgment as to whether that, whether they go together or don't go together, even if they don't go together, they might become an interesting counterpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, the counterpoint between the visual and the music. Yeah. Now you're, you're a professor in uh, Boston. Uh, what are some of the, what are some of the um, uh, challenges and some of the opportunities that you see uh, for your, your students in composition? Okay, Boston College is not a conservatory. So I do not get, uh, you know, I went to New England Conservatory for my master's. I don't get the kind of students that's at New England Conservatory, right? So, but in some ways I kind of, I don't mind that because the kids I get in composition, some of them have gone on to graduate school. As a matter of fact, they've gone to NEC, they've gone to uh, Peabody, they've gone to uh, a jazz musician that I code went to Juilliard on the fellowship. So uh, UCLA is another place. Anyway, I would say, I would say maybe 10 to 12 students since all the years that I've at Boston College have gone into graduate school in music. Um, as a matter of fact, there's one young lady right now. Her name is Alexa Canales. 
and she's doing her doctorate with Bob Aldrich. At no. Yeah. I and actually, uh, I think I know we're, we're uh... classmates. <laughs> yeah, we're classmates. <laughs> yeah, Alexa Canales. Yep. She's a very sweet girl. Well, for example, look at her, right? She had no idea she was going to do composition, but she was good at music theory. So I said to her, Alexa, you know, I'm teaching composition next semester. You should sign up. She said, really? You think I can do it? I said, yeah, come on, try it. And look what happened. Now she's finishing a doctorate. So, so those are the kind of students I get at Boston College. You know, if they're good with theory, I encourage them to try composition. You know, most of them, yeah, kind of lame afterwards. But every once in a while, I'll say, oh, wow, you're OK. I have a, I have a new, another example. Um, last, last spring, you know, last spring, I have this young Chinese girl who was in, I, also another one, I said, you should take composition. She said, oh, I, I need to, you know, I need to get an override because I'm booked already. I said, no, you should do it. So she took composition and I thought she was good. She's a pianist. And then when she graduated and went back to China, you know, with the pandemic, school closed, she went back to China. I encourage her to continue composing. I said, we can do it by email. And I taught her free of charge, you know, what's, what, what is it for me, you know? $25 is meaningless, right? <laughs> so I encourage her so she continued composing all summer and in the fall. And then she applied to graduate school and she got into one of the best graduate schools in China called Central Conservatory of Music. That's the best. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's the best. Yeah. yeah. And she got in as a yeah. composition major. Oh my, that's like going to Juilliard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I said, the funny thing is that I, I haven't been to China for years, right? I had no idea what central conservative music means. Yeah. yeah. When I told my colleagues in my music department, they said, oh my God, yeah. that is serious. Yeah. So, so here she is. She, she had no idea this is something she wants to do, but I said, try it. And then when she was good, I kind of like nurtured her and and now she's, anyway. So so that's the kind of kids I get at, in, at, at Boston College. On the other hand, you might agree with me. Students at the Newton Conservatory, they sort of have a chip on their shoulders. They think they know everything. So they're not gonna even listen to what I was gonna tell them, you know? <laughs> Because I taught there part time for a couple of years, and and that's the kind of attitude I have. This they think they're uh, they're saying they're you know genius or whatever. So so in some ways it's better to to see a young kid with nothing on their brains, and then you sort of like shape them. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Lee, um, what uh, you know besides your YouTube channel? Uh, where can our viewers um, uh, go and listen to your music? Uh, Bandcamp. All right. Bandcamp. And they can listen to a free streaming. Uh, as a matter of fact, if they, just, if they just type my name in on YouTube, there's also audio files that shows up, not just the videos. So I would say Bandcamp. The reason why I prefer Bandcamp over Spotify or Amazon, you know, they're, they're on there too. They're on Spotify and Amazon. I belong to Reverb Nation. Uh, it's a distributor based in North Carolina and they distribute all my albums to Spotify, uh, Spotify, uh, you know, all those other places. Uh, iTunes, you know, Apple Music. Uh, what was the point I was trying to make? Oh. The, the great thing about Bandcamp is that if you log on to an album, you can actually show the lyrics if, if it's a song cycle, right? Next to the, on the right side of the track, it says lyrics. You click it and you have the words. So you can listen to music and all follow the text. So to me, that's important. Uh, Spotify, forget it. There's no text, you know, there's no nothing. iTunes has nothing. And that's another reason why I do scrolling scores on YouTube, because that way they can follow the music and the text, if there's a text.